Hi everyone, my name is Nashipa Chebet, and today we are going to be talking about one of Kenya's most interesting and intriguing assassinations that to date remains unsolved. If you guessed it, you're right, we're talking about the assassination of the late Dr. the Honorable Robert John Oko. There were lots and lots of issues which I should be investigating, which I couldn't do. So I wanted to take it further. I complete my investigation to a satisfactory result. No policeman, either through no or other policeman from UK ever approached me. She told me, young man, the things you have in the book, The Night Bob Die, are uh, mostly fiction. The gentlemen who may have murdered my husband are not the ones you say murdered him. I never had any row with him. I never had any quarrel with him. We never quarreled with him at all. If I was asked to speculate, my speculation would be that perhaps the molasses issue was peripheral to the motives for the killing of Dr. Robert Goh. At the time of his death, he was a member of parliament for Kisumu Town constituency. Prior to that, Robert Oko had served as member of parliament twice elected for Kisumu rural constituency, having won the 1973 and 1977 general election. Um, as a member of parliament, he was then appointed to Minister of Foreign Affairs, and it is in that capacity that he set out on 27th January 1990 as part of a delegation of 83 other ministers and members of the government, which included the then president, Daniel Turoitich Arap Moe. The delegation was going to Washington, D.C. for a prayer breakfast meeting. And some of the events that allegedly took place during that delegation, uh, during that prayer breakfast visit to Washington, D.C., formed a significant part of the investigations, but we'll get there in a bit. So on 4th, no, 4th February 1990, the entire delegation came back to Nairobi. And on 5th uh, February, Oko was in a meeting with Daniel Moy, Hezekiah Oyugi, and Bethwell Kiplagat, together with the Japanese ambassador and the Canadian High Commissioner, after that meeting, Oko got into his car and drove to his country residence in Koru, 300 kilometers outside Nairobi. He remained in Koru from 5th February and February night of 12th February and the morning of 13th February 1990, when the events which still boggle the minds of many Kenyans up to date took place. The only thing we know about what happened on the morning of 13th February 1990 is gleaned from the testimony of his housemaid, Selina Were, who testified to the Scotland Yard that she was woken up by the loud sound of what sounded like a door slamming at 3 a.m. on the morning of 13th February. And she saw a white car turning the corner down the driveway in his Koro residence. The other testimony came from Francis Chiriot, who testified to the Scotland Yard that on that morning he was in Songo office. So Francis Chiriot was a telephonist at Songo office near the Koro farm. And on that morning, he alleged to have seen um, at around 6 a.m. Hezekiah Oyugi, a passenger in a white car with three other persons driving past on two separate occasions. It is not clear what exactly happened because Francis Chariot did not give a written testimony of the events on that day and therefore Oyugi was not compelled to provide an official report with timestamps of where his, his vehicle was on that morning. The other interesting thing is that Joseph Shikuku, a herds boy, 
gave a testimony of uh, having found a body at around 1 p.m. on the same 13th February 1990, uh, that a body that was partially burnt, and this body was found on Got Alilia Hill, that is 2.8 kilometers from Oko's Koro residence. Joseph Were shared this information with, visit with other villagers, which uh, was identified in the Scotland Yard investigations. However, nobody reported the finding of the body to the police, and the body was only recovered on was only found on 16 February, that is three days later, according to the police investigation. What was also found at the site was um, a single Caucasian hair, which was associated to loosely associated with a partially burnt handkerchief near the body. Other items were also found, including a gun, a torch, um, a diesel can and matches. All of this, interestingly, were found to have been linked to items that were kept in Oko's bedroom at that time. With the exception of the jerry can matches and torch. So all of these items were ordinarily found in Oko's bedroom. News of the murder set of riots in Nairobi and initially the first theory as to Oko's death was a suicide. However, that was ruled out upon uh, the uncovering of the fact that there was a shot to Oko's head, that the body had been shot and also partially burned. So that ruled out completely the theory of suicide. So upon mounting public pressure, the then president, Daniel Arap Moy, appointed a commission from the Scotland Yard. He asked uh, those detectives to investigate Oko's death. And on 21st February 1990, Inspector Trull landed in Kenya together with two other officials and a home office forensics investigator. So now we launch into the contents of Trull's investigations of Oko's death. So when Trun was investigating the death of Oko, he came across several theories which we will address one by one. And the first theory that he uncovered in his investigation was the Oko family feud theory. According to Oko's sister Dorothy Randiek, Oko and his brother by the name Barak, didn't, had not been on speaking terms since 1985. So in 1985, Barak was working as a deputy provincial commissioner in Nakuru within the Rift Valley province. From there, he was transferred to be the deputy to the office of the deputy secretary at the attorney general's office, a move he did not agree with. Barak blamed this move on Robert Oko because at that time he wanted to become the provincial commissioner. So he tried to prevent the move, but Robert allegedly did nothing. And that situation remained the same until Oko's death in 1919. The other aspect to the feud in, within the Oko family was with his brother, Colin. So Dorothy Randiak in, her, Randiak, in her testimony, recounted that her family group photograph had been found in 1989 with their mother's picture having been cut out. It is said that Oko blamed his brother Collins for it, and Collins had allegedly also told his mother to never come to his house again, and that if she did, she should be cut to pieces. In his final report uh, submitted in August 1990, Trun concluded that to summarize the immediate family of Oko, I am not satisfied that he have told me everything that they know. There appears to be a shroud of fear surrounding the whole family, which prevents them from fully disclosing that which they know. There was yet a third aspect to the family dynamic within the Oko family, which is that Oko was discovered to have had an affair with one Miss Ogemba. Her full name was Herin Violas Ogembo, and she had met Oko in 1982. And in 1983, their affair resulted in the birth of a daughter. Mrs. Oko, Mrs. Christabel Oko, that is Oko's real wife, discovered the affair in 1989. 
The affair ran from 1982 up to his death in 1980, in 1990 and was allegedly very open with very many of Oko's close associates and friends being aware of this. And Miss Ogembo was Miss Ogembo used to be taken on several trips and official visits abroad organized by Mr. Oko. The interesting part um, is that Mrs. Oko and Miss Ogembo crossed paths when in 1989 and a phone call was allegedly made to Mrs. Oko from Miss, Miss Ogembo. So Mrs. Oko testified that was, she received a phone call from someone just before Oko's death alleging to be Oko's second wife. On the other hand, Ms. Ogembo also said that she received a threatening phone call from someone informing her that Mrs. Oko knew about the affair and her life was in danger. So according to his sister Randiak's testimony, Oko believed that his brother Barak had been the one to feed that information in. To date, nobody is aware of who actually made that phone call to both women. So aside from that, the, the theory around family feuds within the Oko family, on 17th March, Inspector Trun's investigations of the death took a completely different trajectory when he received a, a sealed envelope from Switzerland containing certain information which we shall get into in a short time. So in paragraphs 101 and 102 of his investigation, and I'm going to read verbatim what John said, he stated that on Saturday 17th March, my colleague Detective Sergeant Lindsay received a telephone call to meet a person in the Imperial Hotel Kisumu. Lindsay attended the venue and there met a person who identified himself as Professor Thomas A. Ogada, the Kenyan ambassador to Switzerland and that Professor Ogada informed Lindsay that he had been directed by His Excellency, the President, to hand over to the Scotland Yard officers a sealed envelope, which he had brought with him for, from Switzerland. In addition to the envelope, Professor Ogada supplied details of two contacts in relation to the contents, one being Miss Bryna Martin, and the other being her advocate in Kenya, Mr. Frank Adley of Kaplan and Stratton Advocates, Nairobi. Now, it's interesting that Trun mentioned the president in his interim report, but he did not mention the then president, Daniel Moy, in his final report submitted in August 1919. So from this point, there's a theory that gained currency within Trun's investigation of the involvement of a Mr. Nicholas Biwot, who was then the Minister for Energy. So then there are two aspects to this particular investigation at this point. There's the Kisumu Molasses Plant Theory and the Washington DC Theory, both of which implicated Mr. Nicholas Biwot in, two, in various capacities. So an interesting aspect that came up with Trun's investigations after March 1990 was a Washington trip theory, where it was alleged that as when they had gone uh, to Washington, D.C. from 27th January 1990 up to 4th February, a dispute had occurred. And the dispute arose because allegedly Oko had gone into a meeting with George W. Bush Sr., However, that theory was soon ruled out because there was no evidence of any dispute whatsoever having taken place after interviewing all the delegates that went on that trip. And further, there was no evidence that Oko actually met George W. Bush Sr. So that, that theory was soon thrown out. There was an allegation made some 12 years later that there was a dispute during the Washington DC trip and upon coming back, Oko's bodyguards were dismissed. He was stripped of his ministerial rank and his passport was re removed. And in addition to that, he traveled back to Nairobi on a different flight. However, this was found to be without foundation because passenger manifests and witness testimony proved that Oko traveled back to Nairobi with the rest of the delegation. And the delegation's return was a publicly reported event in which where photos are still available um, 
where President Moy and Oko came out of the plane together and were seen doing welcoming rounds at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. And in fact, after his return from Washington, Oko was assigned an official trip to Gambia to deputize Komoe, and he would have been unable to tra travel without a uh, passport. Mrs. Oko further later gave evidence that she handed her husband's passport to Detective Superintendent Trudeau. So official records and witness testimony also prove that Oko continued to discharge his official functions, meeting with President Moy, as we had on the same meeting happened on 5th February, government officials and diplomats, and to give instructions to his official um, his official staff. So to date, there is no credible evidence to support Trun's conclusion that the Washington trip was a motive for Oko's murder. So now we go back to the other um, theory, which is the Kisumu molasses plant theory. This theory is convoluted and has very many aspects to it. So the first being that uh, Nicholas Biwot, Professor George Saitoti and others had asked for bribes to facilitate the Kisulu molasses plant. And when these bribes were not paid, Nicholas Biwot stood in the way of the project. This lacked any evidential basis because of the time scale by and over which the decision was made to halt the Kisumu molasses project. So this also removes it as a likelihood of any dispute in 1990. So cabinet papers, paper records and Oko's own correspondence prove that ultimately all decisions relating to the molasses project were taken by the Kenyan cabinet and it also records that both he and Nicholas Biwoto agreed as to the need for the rehabilitation of the molasses project. And he also attests to the assistance that Nicholas Biwoto gave Oko and the cooperation between the two men. So the allegation that Nicholas Biwoto was championing an alternative tender system was also in order to receive a kickback from the project, was also kicked aside because the two companies which are the two companies concerned, that is the Italian firms ABB Teconomasio SPA and Teconomasio Italiano Stuck Brown Boveri, were bro both introduced to the minister Dalmas Otieno by Domenico Aegahi and both belong to the same multinational group. Therefore, it ruled out the theory that there was any involvement in terms of a rival tender and there could have been no bribe asked for and paid by a, a group within itself or paid for a company to pitch for a tender against itself. Additionally, Nicholas Biwot's involvement to the Molasses Project ended on 3rd November 1987 when the Kenyan cabinet assigned that specific duty to the ministries of industry and finance and not the Ministry of Energy, which Nicholas Biot had been sharing. And all this happened over two years before Oko was murdered, and therefore this, there can be no link between the activities to do with the Molasses project and Oko's death. The project itself was, in fact, effectively abandoned in 1988, and that decision was taken by Dalmas Otieno, who had replaced Oko as a minister for industry following the elections that took place that same year. This decision was taken over one and a half years before Oko's death and therefore could not have had any implications with the murder. An important aspect to consider is that Trun rejected Dalmas Otieno's evidence and did not read or ask for the Kenyan government's molasses file that would have substantiated Dalmas Otieno's witness testimony. So Dalmas Otieno decides for his reliance on their testimony for his failure to investigate their background because at the time that uh, Iragi was in Kenya, he was, subject, he was out on bail and had been subject to an investigation in Italy for allegations of fraud and particularly was found to have committed the offense of dishonesty. 
On 14th March 1987, Iragi and an accomplice were convicted by the Civil and Criminal Court of Milan on charges of alleged corruption. So it was also found that Iragi had presented false evidence and false documents in order to establish his defense. It was unknown to Trun at the time of his investigation that the BAK, the company through which Iragi and, and Brian Amata intended for the Molasses project, used four different names and two addresses in three years. So Dalmas Otieno, Kenya's Minister for Industry, eventually gave evidence to Trun that BAK was ultimately excluded from the Molasses project because it was incompetent and also for breach of contract. After Oko's murder, Airagi and Bryna Martin made a claim for losses in relation to the Molasses project um, to an extent of 5.975 million US dollars. So Trun accepted that in the absence of evidence from Airagi and Bryna Martin, there was no evidence against Nicholas Beward. So Trun eventually gave his final report in August 1919 after having explored all these theories. In October 1990, President Moy appointed a public inquiry into the death of Ouko, which was chaired by Justice Evans Gisheru. The inquiry was terminated over one year later in November 1991 by President Moy, at a point when Trun was being cross-examined on grounds that he did not, on grounds that he needed to return to the UK. The Gisheru Commission did not produce a final report and was disbanded. After the Gisheru Commission was disbanded, the Kenya police then launched an investigation. And during that investigation, 10 government officials, including Nicholas Biwot and the head of internal security, Hezekiah Oyugi, were detained for questioning in relation to the murder. So Nicholas Biwot was released after two weeks in the absence of any evidence to support the allegations. However, one person, Ajona Anguka, who was a district commissioner from Nakuru, was tried for Oko's murder in 1992 and acquitted with the crime remaining unsolved. Anguka later fled uh, on exile to the United States, saying he feared for his life and has since published a book called Absolute Power, denying his involvement in the old commander. March 2003, the newly elected government of Mwai Kibaki opened a new investigation, which was carried out by parliament, a parliamentary select committee. So during the course of the deliberations by the committee, several members of parliament publicly condemned how the investigations were being done. Some left the committee and others who remained declared that they would not support the committee's finding. Iragi and Bryna Martin also agreed to testify, but on the condition that they would not be cross-examined, which is the same thing that they had also avoided during Trun's investigation. And Nicholas Biwot was not allowed to call witnesses on his behalf or cross-examine or address any other witnesses. However, the select committee did not complete his, its work and was disbanded in 2005 on the grounds of interference. This was just before Nicholas B. was set to give his testimony. The incomplete report of the select committee investigating circumstances leading to the death of the late Dr. the Honorable Robert John Oko EGH MP was never debated in the Kenyan Parliament, in the Kenyan House of Assembly, or put to a vote. In 2010, a report was presented in Parliament which states that the murder was carried out in one of the then President Daniel Toroitich Arap Moe's residences. It also called for further investigations into top officials, including one of Moe's closest allies, the late Nicholas Biwot, who denied responsibility. In late December 2010, the report was rejected by Parliament on the grounds of a lack of unity and disagreements within the committee. To date, nobody knows 
what exactly happened around the murder of the late, the Honorable Robert John Oko. As far as we are concerned, it remains Kenya's longest case of who done it. Remember to subscribe, like, and share. Thank you. Just a game Cause I got high hopes